Thanks for listening to the Thyroid Fixer podcast with your host, me, Dr. Amy Horneman, AKA the Thyroid Fixer. Also functional medicine practitioner, hormone and weight loss expert. We're talking all things thyroid, hormone and health related in order to empower, educate and transform you. Remember, I fix your thyroid, I fix your hormones, I fix your life. So let's get started. This is kind of a mini lesson for practitioners working with thyroid and hormone patients. And hey, if you're a patient too, you can certainly listen up, right? Because you're always, always learning. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. One of these days, I do want to actually build a practitioner only training because what I'm finding as I'm going through these years of working with other practitioners and treating patients is that even, and I, and I have a couple episodes where I'm bitching about functional and integrative practitioners literally having zero clue about the thyroid, thinking that they're going to magically produce T3 in your body by healing your gut and adrenals. I, I complain about that often, but this is more for the practitioners that they're, you're right there. You are right on the cusp of being a thyroid expert. And we just need to clear through some of the clutter. We need to weed through some of the misnomers and misinformation out there. And I feel like we need a little bit of de-brainwashing of what you may or may have learned in your conventional training that just needs to, we need to clear those cobwebs, clear them out, clear them out and start fresh. Okay, so this might get, you know, I don't think it's going to get too deep in the scientific hole where the general listener isn't going to want to listen. No, listen up. When we're talking about thyroid, okay, I've done separate videos and podcasts on TSH alone. I think it needs to be at least touched upon, right? TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. 
you learned in school, whether you're a naturopathic doctor, medical doctor, osteopathic doctor, I don't care what you are, but you learn that TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is the go-to test to determine thyroid problems. Here's the problem. If you test someone and their TSH is through the roof, obviously you know that there's a thyroid problem, but do you know how many patients I have seen whose TSH literally is a 1.5, a 1.9, a 2.1? It's actually falling in that functional medicine optimal range of less than a two, but yet they are not optimal. That patient is not optimal. And if you look at the rest of their labs, you can actually see low free T3, low free T4, sometimes elevated reverse T3, even before they're on a medication. And then you can see the presence of antibodies. So you cannot stop at TSH alone. Beyond that, you cannot change dosing based on TSH. Once you start giving someone a small amount of T3, I don't care if it's that baby dose that's going to keep the person hypo, and we're going to talk about that as well today. But anytime you give anyone T3, and quite frankly, I have seen suppressed TSH on large amounts of T4 only, or T4 only period for a decade. That is going to to suppress someone's TSH. And if you think back to biology, and this is where I urge, I urge all doctors and practitioners and prescribers listening to this, I urge you to go back to biology, get rid of anything that you learned in med school. I mean, anything. And Honestly, I'm going to divert here. I'm going to say it was it was said by Dr. David Brownstein. I love this quote. I love it. He said that a professor of his on graduation day from med school stood up and told everyone in that class that 50% of what you have learned will be completely obsolete in the next three years. And I think actually it's a little bit faster than that. Like literally 50% of everything that you've learned will be obsolete in a year because medicine is always changing. Why are we not changing our thyroid treatment paradigm with advancements in technology and knowledge? Now that we have the knowledge, we need to change as well. Do you think that your Apple iPhone is the same Apple iPhone as it was back in 2007? No, it has changed with technology. And if it stayed the same, they'd be out of business. Apple would be no better than gateway computers, right? So we have to change as practitioners with the changing paradigm of treatment. And that is the thyroid is the one area where I see the majority of practitioners stuck. They are just stuck and they're scared. And it's a fear tactic Just like you are being scared by the media right now, unnecessarily, this is a fear tactic that the medical board puts out to almost, I don't know, have some kind of of holier than thou control over how you treat your patients because this is sick care and they want to make sure that you don't actually get your patients better because we want them, you know, the, the medical board and the drug and the FDA and all the drug companies and big pharma want people to stay sick. So if you could actually do something to improve their life and literally give someone their life back, optimize them, keep them out of disease states of aging, how much money are you then taking away from the drug companies as a practitioner by healing someone by healing someone. God forbid you do that. So let's go back to biology with the TSH and recognize that it comes, the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary, pituitary talks to the thyroid. A low TSH does not produce bone loss or arrhythmia. Now, can you give someone... Yeah, I mean, I get, yeah, you can overdose someone on T3 and throw them into some kind of tachycardia situation. And and even that, I'm going to say, would be debatable based on their perception of their heart rate 
racing? Like, is it actually tachycardia where we're looking at a 160 heart rate for resting or are they just a person that's like, oh my God, my heart's racing. Well, that's because you were low and slow and hypo and your resting heart rate was not that of Lance Armstrong at an athletic 50. You were so damn hypo that your heart rate was 50 and now it's 80 and now you think it's racing, but it's actually normal. So there's that whole argument right there. But low TSH does not cause bone loss, does not cause tachycardia. That is not the cause of it. If you're getting bone loss, then that's because you have someone who's lazy AF and is laying around, not walking, not picking up a weight, not doing any kind of of exercise. They're probably obese. They're not taking any supplements. They're not taking vitamin D, vitamin K, and magnesium to keep strong bones whatsoever. They're eating nothing but processed foods. Their insulin is most likely high, which is completely robbing their, their body of bone. And they probably have no estrogen too. So it's not the T3 that you're giving them. It's not because they have a 0.05 TSH. It's because they have no estrogen and they treat their body like a piece of garbage. That's why they have bone loss. If you do a DEXA scan on me, I am on 150 micrograms of T3 and I have been for easily 15 to 17 years now, but I work out. I lift heavy shit. I take my D and my K and my mag. I do not have any bone loss. So if suppressed TSH, which mine is 0 zero seven. You want me to say that again? 0. 0.007 is my TSH. Do I have bone loss? Do I have tachycardia? No, I don't at all. And, and I'm not the only one. I have patients who are on 50 and 75 and 100 and 125 micrograms of T3, and they do not have bone loss and they are not hyper. And that's the other thing with TSH. A low TSH does not mean that someone is hyperthyroid. You have to ask them, how do you feel? What are your symptoms? And then you have to look at that free T3 and free T4. If both of those are through the roof, here's the definition of hyper. And don't roll your eyes if you're a practitioner listening to this because you need to hear it. The definition of hyper, true functional medicine definition of hyper, the real definition of hyperthyroid is someone with seriously elevated free T3, elevated free T4, suppressed TSH, and they are anxious and jittery and agitated and they're sweating and their heart's racing and they don't feel good at all. That is hyperthyroidism. Suppressed TSH is not hyper. Couldn't mean that they're optimal could mean actually that they're still hypo because remember, a small amount of T3 will produce a low TSH, suppressed TSH. So let's get into dosing T3 because that's the other really, really big hang up that I'm seeing. Many of you are still scared of increasing T3 dosing. So if we look at the anecdotal evidence. If you talk to all the, if I could get every thyroid functional thyroid expert in a room, myself and Karen Martell and Dr. Weston Childs and L Russ and Anshul Gupta. I mean, let's get us all in a room. Even Isabella went, she's retired, but she's still the thyroid pharmacist, right? She still knows her optimal lab values and dosing of T3. Let's get, let's get all the thyroid experts in a room. And, and check in with them about where they normally, what dose of T3 are they on and where do they normally see their patients and clients optimized with T3. And they're going to tell you really someone has to hit about 30 to 50 micrograms of T3 minimum in order for them to come out of that hypo state. Because the problem when, with giving someone a very low dose of T3 And this is with armor as well. I will see patients come to me and they will be on 15 milligrams of armor twice a day, or they'll be on 30 milligrams of armor once a day, or they'll be on five micrograms of T3 twice a day. 
And that is keeping them in this deep hypo state. Their doctor thinks that they're doing a good job by giving them something other than T4, which, okay, yes, I would rather have someone on a little bit of T3 than nothing at all. But you have to not, you have to come out of that, that mental block. You literally have a mental block. If you are fearful of giving someone the T3 that they need, and I'm not saying take every patient and throw them on 25 mics twice a day, but at least be open to the fact that there are people out there that absolutely need more T3. 100% they do. And I'm going to tell you my unsupported hypothesis in this. The type A drivers, the entrepreneurs, the go-getters, the athletes, the, 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 the people that are doing multiple things in a day, they're running a business, they're running a family, they're playing sports, they're active, they're working out, their brain is going all the time. Those are the people that in general need a little bit more T3 in their treatment protocol than does, let's say, you know, someone that's sitting at home and not doing a whole lot. And listen, that's fine. I mean, to be, I would like to be a type B because that would mean that my mind wasn't racing as much. But <laughs> those, you know, just some people need a little bit less T3, but some people need more. And that's the message that I want to give is to be open-minded enough because to get these people optimized, you have to think outside the box. You can't stop at a certain number and say, well, I will give T3, but I won't give more than 30 or else I'll get in trouble by my medical board. Screw your medical board. Treat your patient first, because if you're not treating the patients first, you're going to be out of business anyways, because people aren't going to be coming to you because they still feel like shit. You gave them this little bit of T3 and they're staying hypo. You have to think outside that box. Moving on to reverse T3. I just had a conversation with a colleague of mine about this when people are coming in with elevated reverse T3. Yes, we want to find that reason. So the reasons for elevated reverse T3, and I have a totally separate podcast on this, but the reasons for elevated causes of elevated reverse T3 can be the following, but are not limited to estrogen dominance, increased insulin or insulin resistance, low iodine is a big one, huge, low magnesium, selenium, zinc, that will cause elevated reverse T3. Low ferritin will cause elevated reverse T3. Adrenal dysfunction. So if your cortisol is legit in the tank, it is just bottomed out. Or for some odd reason, you're riding this high cortisol pattern all day long, that can push up reverse T3. And there are also two genetic SNPs, DIO1, DIO2, that can also cause conversion issues and increase reverse T3 or make the patient feel worse even before that reverse goes up. So while we are looking at that elevator reverse T3 and saying, hey, we want to find the underlying cause of it, I don't want to do a four-month detective investigation on what's causing the reverse T3 and trying to treat that while the person is feeling like ass and all they really needed was someone to drop the damn T4 medication because they're rolling in at 125 milligrams of T4 and they're on five or 10 micrograms of T3. This is a simple fix. Lower the T4, add in T3, and that reverse will come down. Now, what if you have this random patient that's on like 50 micrograms of T4 and they're on, let's say, 20 micrograms of T3, and the reverse is still high. Absolutely, you want to do the digging to find the root cause. But what we sometimes do as well is do T3 only. Like, let's say they're coming in with a reverse T3 of a 20. You're like, what in the hell? They're not even on that much T4. So what you do is run T3 only, maybe for a couple of weeks, to push that reverse T3 down. Because remember, the only thing that converts to reverse T3 is T4. So whether it's the T4 that they are producing by their own thyroid gland or the T4 that they are being given in the form of medication, whether it's Levo, Synthroid, Tyrosin, Armor, NP, any kind of NDT medication, 
will convert over to reverse T3. So if you give them T3 only, that pushes down the reverse. At the same time, you are addressing all of those underlying root causes. So do the both and treatment protocol, like I say that I do with my patients, do the both and. So look at all those other things that are going on, but for God's sake, lower their T4 and increase their T3. Because if you keep them on that same dose of T4 and that same baby dose of T3, they are going to suffer and you are the one that's going to look bad. You are the one that's going to look bad because they are going to come back and say, you did not help me. I don't feel better. I spent all this money doing all these functional effing tests. Okay, you checked my adrenals and you checked my gut and blah, blah, blah. Great. But I don't feel any better as a patient. And I came to you to feel better. So, so we have to make a change. We have to be open enough to change that medication and at the same time be addressing root causes which my colleague totally agreed with. So we had a great conversation. I also think that the paradigm of, at least in the functional community, is definitely shifting based on common sense, actually, on using T4 in general. So if we look at T4, okay, yes, we want you to have some T4 if you can. Because a lot of you will ask, a lot of the listeners, not practitioners, the listeners will ask, patients will ask, well, why are we using T4 only if it's inactive? And I say, well, we want you to have some stores of T4. Like we want you to have like a supply. You know, it's like your savings account, right? We want you to be able to pull from that when you need it. But when you really think about the fact that T4 is totally inactive, T4 is inactive. It absolutely has to convert over to T3 to do anything in your body. That little pill of Synthroid does nothing unless it converts. So why are we giving all of these thyroid patients an inactive thyroid hormone and we're crossing our fingers and wishing on a rainbow that it converts? Why aren't we giving more of the active thyroid hormone? If T3 was going to kill us, I think God would have pulled back a little bit on, on the T, you know, T3 actually working in our body and every cell has a receptor site for T3 on it. I don't think that God would have made us that way if T3 was going to kill us. If T3 was going to make you suddenly be like Samuel L. Jackson and unbreakable and you're walking down the street and you break a, a leg, Right. That's not what is happening when you give T3. We're seeing more heart attacks from this damn VAX than we are with any kind of T3 administration. So trust me, you're rolling more of a dice going that way than you are taking T3. So why not give someone the active thyroid hormone that is actually going to get into the cell, that is actually going to give them a, a metabolism, that's actually going to elevate their mood and light up their brain and, and balance their sex hormones and help with insulin resistance and help with cholesterol and hyperlipidemia and help with their constipation because they haven't pooped in five days. Why wouldn't we give them that? Why would we give them the inactive form? or at least more of the inactive form. Now, I realize that some people are converters and some people do take that T3 or T4 and convert it over to T3. And for the most part, they're doing okay. If they're on T4 only, they most likely are not doing okay. But if they are on T4 and T3, okay, that can be a good combination. But here's the thing. I want you as a practitioner to also be open to the fact that someone might require more T3 than T4, and they might actually require T3 only as a treatment. So let me explain the T3 only path. And I did a specialized training for a group of practitioners a while ago about this. So I'm going to kind of pull from my, my brain and, and my slides of what I showed during that presentation to determine whether or not someone is T3 only can be black and white on paper with elevated reverse T3, or it could actually be trial and error. What do I mean by that? You might give someone T4, 
let's say you're giving Susie Q, your patient, 25 micrograms of T4, and you see that reverse T3 go sky high. It's hitting 18, 19, 20 on this little bit of dose of T4. Okay, so pull out the T4, do T3 only, and see what happens to that reverse. So sometimes it is flat out cut and dry, simple, simple cut and dry. Other times it's not so black and white. Sometimes it's trial and error, meaning you might give someone T4 and you don't see that reverse T3 increase, but this person just feels horrible. And I'm going to give you a, a, an actual example. Let's say you have someone on 100 micrograms of T3 split dose 50-50, so 50 micrograms BID, and you have 25 micrograms of T4 in the mix. And that person is just feeling like ass. And you're like, what is happening? They're on a lot of T3. Like they, their T3 levels, their free T3 is like a four. You know, what the heck is going on? And you pull the T4. So the reverse T3 is fine. Reverse T3 is rolling in at like a eight. So reverse T3 is totally fine. The person feels horrible. You pull the T4 give it a couple of weeks. And the person's like, wow, okay. Now my hypo symptoms are starting to lift. The brain fog is lifting. I feel more energetic and I lost a pound. Then you put the T4 back in and they get worse again. That is the trial and error. That is your roadmap to that person being a T3 only candidate, being a T3 only patient. You got there through trial and error. You didn't get there through an elevator reverse T3 because people can feel worse on T4 before that reverse elevates. So if you give me, I am T3 only, I said it earlier in the podcast, I'm T3 only, if you give me 25 micrograms of T4, I will be five pounds heavier in a week and I will be depressed. How do I know this? Trial and error. I've done it already. I'm not gonna do it again, but I've done it already. And also practitioners, please remember that the smallest change can make a big difference as well in their dosing. So when we're talking about T3, let's say you have someone on a hundred and that fear is starting to creep in, right? That the medical board is chirping in your ear. You know what you need to do, but you're scared. And that fear is creeping in. You go, oh, I don't want to go above a hundred. I'm not sure. That difference between 100 and 125 can mean life or death for that person. Let me explain. This is years ago, and I experiment on myself so I can deliver my experience, my anecdotal N equals one experience to you, the listener, as well as to my practitioners and prescribers out there who I'm trying to give this message to without tr you know, formally training you. This is a free, free training, right? No, no cost on this training. So if you, and I've done this before, if you pull out a small dose of T3, let's say you have someone on 125 and you remove 25 because you want to drop them down, that can literally mean life or death. There was one point in time where I wanted to see if I could get my TSH up out of the toilet. Just again, just experimenting folks, just experimenting. I know better. I pulled out 25 micrograms of T3. Now, mind you, I am on 150. 25? Itty bitty. That's nothing. That shouldn't make a difference, right? Oh my God. I really have never been depressed in my life. I know many of you suffer from depression and my heart goes out to you because it's a horrible feeling. That time I was depressed. I actually said out loud, this is what people feel like when they say they don't want to get out of bed in the morning. This is actual true depression. I became depressed from a small, small, minuscule change in my T3 dose. So prescribers, practitioners, doctors, NPs, OBGYNs, PAs, any of you listening, NDs, you can make or break someone with. 10 to 25 micrograms. You pull that on someone who's not optimal, they're going down. If you don't add in because of fear, the T3 that they need, they're staying low and sick. 
Your job is to bring them out of their basement. Your job is to give them their life back. Our job is to give people their lives back. You have to keep an open mind. Now, I get it. I Listen, I'm not bashing here at all. This is totally educational, a little laid back educational. Okay, if I do an actual training pro- program, it will be more structured. But we are going to have, if I do a training program for practitioners, we are going to have live meetings where we talk just like this. And I call out bullshit and you can bring case studies to the table and, and I will call out your fears. I will see your fears. I'll see you grimace and grunt. And, oh, I don't know if I want to do that because I might get in trouble by somebody, but I learned that you shouldn't do this and I sh- you shouldn't do that. What you learned is most likely obsolete. What you learned about the thyroid is most likely obsolete because think about what you've learned so far. TSH is all you need, right? Didn't they teach you that? TSH is the only marker that you need to check for thyroid problems. And then you just need to give them T4 and they'll be fine. That's literally what you have learned. And that is so wrong, so wrong, so wrong. I don't even have the words. So if that is wrong, think about everything else. Think about what you, maybe you have heart. Well, don't you dare go higher than 10 micrograms of T3. Okay, good. Then the person's going to stay hypo. Oh, you don't need to test anything else other than TSH. Oh, they're thyroid antibodies. They're not actually flagged high, so they don't have Hashimoto's. Think about all those things that you've learned or even in your area of specialty. Maybe you're a gut expert. Maybe you're an adrenal expert. Maybe you're a hormone expert. Think of the myths that you have busted already in your area of expertise and and think about that and think about how many things need to be busted and dismissed and literally push to the back of your mind or out of your mind completely in treating thyroid patients too. Okay, I will leave you with that. I want to keep it nice and brief. Those are the important pieces that I am seeing over and over again in my practice with patients coming to me who have been working with someone else, even if they were working with someone else who kind of sort of knew the thyroid and kind of sort of started treating them, maybe that's you. And I'm getting your patient and I'm fixing them because you dropped the ball. (laughs) Sorry, bone up on thyroid treatment and how to actually make someone optimal. You're not going to kill them. There's not going to be a medical malpractice lawsuit. You're actually giving them their life back. And dare I say, dare I say that withholding T3 is medical malpractice in and of itself, because that is the one thing that is going to make people better. That is the one thyroid hormone that gets into your cell to do its job. We need it. You hold it back. You're holding back life from a person. Be the best practitioner that you can be and keep learning, keep expanding and keep learning. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I hope you loved it. And as always, if you would be so kind to leave a review, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, that would be absolutely amazing. I read all of them. Also, anything that you hear on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat any kind of medical condition. So we always recommend that you check with your medical provider, your doctor, your nurse practitioner before implementing anything that you hear on this podcast. And if you want to find out more about working together, you can click the link below in the show notes to book a discovery call. And there you'll be talking to a member of my team. They are an extension of me. They are amazing. And you and I will talk after that once we get you all signed up and you and I get to work together. All right. I hope to see you soon.